with me. Take your seats if you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we're coming from. Hallelujah. We're going to be speaking about wounded healers. Wounded healers, wounded healers. Knowing that this moment for sure is exposing the fragility of our humanity. And even in spite of that, we are still called by God to remain people on purpose, acknowledging our faithfulness to God's call. So the scripture we'll, we'll spend a few moments coming from in the next maybe 20 minutes or so we we'll hope to encourage us to lean into the contradictions of what it means to be human in a world that God created to be good. But yet we are always reminded of its fallenness. And there is some who would want to use religion particularly Christian faith as a uh, as lidocaine to numb us from the world to give us platitudes to speak always aspirationally but not fully appreciate that the greatest mystery of the gospel is that God, who is eternal and holy, took on the flesh of a finite and evil world. It is the incarnation, God fully human, fully divine. That God lives in contradictions. And if God is living and manifesting God's self through these contradictions, what does it mean for you and I to become more willing as followers of Jesus to not run from contradictions, but to lean into them and ask God in our leaning, God, show me what you require of us. I am one who believes that one of our greatest calls in this season is to elevate our conversation beyond sides of right and wrong and justice and injustice, although I believe that there are right actions. There are just actions. But much of what we're seeing, I believe, in this moment is a manifestation of historical trauma that is largely unaddressed in our country and certainly unaddressed in our personal lives. We are a people constantly bombarded with moral injuries, injuries that pierce our physical bodies and damage the part of you that cannot be measured in a test tube. And my hope and prayer is that we people of faith, followers of Jesus, those who have a robust sense, a theological grasp of the complexity of our human construction will know that our spiritual faith, our spiritual being must also be attended to if we are going to be fully human in this world. And when we forsake the reality of both the temporal and the spiritual and want to boil everything down to the physical, the now, the ahistorical. I think we rob ourselves of who God is and what God requires of us. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 speaks very powerfully in this regard. I'm reading from the, the, the message version. So follow along uh, either on the screen or in your own text, if you will. Uh, it has a bit of a paraphrase, but these words, I believe, 
capture powerfully what we are faced with. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness that we carry this precious, precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that because you know for yourselves that we're not, we're not that much to look at. Touch your neighbor, somebody. I know some of y'all look real good this morning, but we've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. Hallelujah. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do also to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. But what Jesus did among them, he also does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. We're not keeping this quiet, not on your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe. We believe that it is the one who raised up the master Jesus, who will just as certainly raise us up with you alive. Every detail then works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without God's unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. There's your hope, Sister Toya. The lavish celebration prepare for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. <laughs> Maybe say thanks be to God. Now, I am always very mindful, my brothers and sisters, that in these moments of trauma, both historical trauma and personal trauma, you and I must be people who take seriously our self-care. It is so important for you and I to appreciate that no matter what is happening on the outside, you and I have an ultimate responsibility to be stewards of the body, the mind, and the spirit that God has given us. In these moments, self-care is so critical because it is often a challenge. If you're like me or any of all us, any workaholics in the house today, folk that just can't never stop doing anything, that we will run ourselves into the ground and then when these traumatic acts happen, it can be the straw that breaks the proverbial back. Could it be that one of the things in this moment is that God is asking you and I to be people who are aware of the rhythm of life, that even our Jesus showed us that when Jesus was in the earth, he engaged with his highest vocation and calling. He healed folk. He produced many miracles, but you constantly found Jesus retreating to spend time with the Father. 
You found Jesus engaging in rigorous disciplines of the spirit and of the mind and of the heart. And this was God in the flesh. Now, I know some of us, we superheroes in our own mind. But could it be that if God in the flesh had to take some time to recharge? Hello, somebody. You may need to find some time to pull away from the protests. Pull away from the drama in your life. Pull away from the tension of your relationship the, 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 the slave driving of your job. Hello, somebody living in this Bay Area. How many know we, we got to work 12 hours just to make our ends meet? But could it be that God is also wanting you to appreciate that we can do all that we can in our own power and still find ourselves falling woefully short? So if we're going to have to engage in this fallen world, what does it mean to engage in rhythms of life? Rhythms that bring life. Rhythms that acknowledge that you are called to be a healer, but you are also one who has been wounded. And these wounds are not always physical. These wounds are sometimes psychological. Sometimes spiritual, emotional, and we must acknowledge the woundedness of this moment. That life is showing us how fragile and quickly it can end. Now that's a reality that we must rest with. And there are many reasons why this is true. I, I love this quote, Dr. William Barber, one of our mentors. He, he always talks about it like this, that the perpetrator was caught, but the killer is still at large. And that is such a powerful analysis of what's happening. That we can catch as many people as we want. But we will not be able to address the killer that is still at large. If we lose sight of the reality of this, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities powers, rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. Now for many of us, we quickly want to go to the devil that we can't see and think that that scripture is just talking about that. But I want you to know that there are some devils that we can name and see that we cannot kill with a bullet, nor can you lock it up in somebody's jail. Hello, somebody. There has not been one day in the history of this country where the bodies of dark-skinned people, natives, Mexican, El Salvadorian, Haitian, African, Dominican, at one time, Irish was included in that. Hello, somebody. At what time, Jewish folk were considered in that. Body subjected to arbitrary violence by the hands of this state. United States of America. So people talk about we got to go back to the good old days. I'm trying to figure out what days were so good. What, 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 what was it? Was it, was it back when you were doing genocide? This whole area, San Francisco, Bay Area, belong to other people. Right now we are worshiping in this church on somebody else's land that was taken violently. 
blood is baked in the soil of the history of our country and yet people want to say we have to come back together and I say to folk from the White House all the way down to the neighborhood we have not yet been together And part of our task as the church is not continue to perpetuate a beautiful lie and ignore the ugly truth that this country and this world that is fallen majors in fragmentation, not unification. And you and I then are called in this moment to not reject history or live ahistorically but wrestle with the historical harm. Work to repair what has been broken and live our lives restoring what's been lost. You hear me today? Recognize historical harm. Repair what's been broken and restore that which has been lost. That is not the job of just white folk or black folk or Asian folk or brown folk or native folk. That is the job of everyone who is breathing and alive. That we are all called to this calling. So coming back together is not an exercise where we sing Kumbaya. We must come together to do the work of bringing peace and justice and healing to the world. My brothers and sisters, part of what the path of healing and wholeness requires is us to lean into the contradictions. The contradictions that remind us that number one, uh, we must embrace the ordinary treasure that we have. Everybody say ordinary treasure. Verse 7 says that we have treasure in earthly vessels. Now, I need you to appreciate a couple things. Number one, you are a human being. You are not limitless. You are not a deity. Hello, somebody. I know there's some nice theories running around that will want to equate all of us with God or, or over-determine our humanity by that which is absolutely beyond us. But we're seeing every day that our humanity is fragile. And part of what it means to be human is to appreciate that humans cry. Humans laugh. Humans get angry. Humans make mistakes. Humans succeed. Humans fail. Humans learn. Humans grow. Humans are right. Humans are wrong. Humans need to learn to say sorry. Humans need to love. Humans need to be loved. Humans hurt. Humans heal. Humans are finite. We are vulnerable. We suffer. We triumph. We ask questions. We give half-baked answers. Hello, somebody. We are often forced to acknowledge our mortality through tragedies, illness, sickness, and pain. This ordinariness, this humanity is something we must embrace, but not be limited by. Why? Because we also have treasure. Your ordinariness is a treasure when you are able to fully appreciate how that which is within you that cannot be measured by a scientist is the exact thing that is needed to bring healing and wholeness to the world. You're ordinary, 
but you also have treasure. Now the challenge for us is what does it mean to make sure that our ordinariness does not over determine our treasure? Part of why it's so important for us to acknowledge our humanity, I believe, in this moment is because you and I can understand, even if we can't agree with, how people can perform such heinous actions. I don't agree with the police officers who shoot people. I don't believe or agree with why Pookie shoots people. I don't agree with our country as Dr. King, who says is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. I don't agree with terrorists and others who would inflict such harm on police officers or innocent civilians. But when you as an ordinary human being are raised in a predatory environment, wish I could talk to somebody in here, you will become a predator. If we are raising our children in environments where all they see is death and murder and violence, we should not be surprised when we find that death and violence manifesting itself. We should not be surprised when trauma reaches a breaking point in the mind, the ordinary limited mind of our loved ones, and they break. Their psyche breaks. I don't agree with the violence, but I understand that we are living in a traumatized and broken world. And yet still we have treasure. Treasure that God is constantly calling out of us as a way to help heal even in the middle of our woundedness. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. We have to then cultivate the treasure rather than be overdetermined by the ordinariness. We have to engage in practices that Cultivate the divinity inside of us. Augustine said it like this, that God became human so humans can become like God. You becoming like God, you cultivating that treasure inside of you is much different than you being God. Let's be clear. Because God cannot be touched and reduced and, and killed with a bullet. But I don't care how elevated you get. <laughs> I wish I could talk to you today. There is something that can bring you down to the ground. So our liberation work then, it sits inside of the opportunity for you and I to be people who are what? Able to cultivate the treasure on the inside. And I and you must be willing to live in that kind of contradiction. I gotta admit, some days I hate sitting in an organization doing my daily work that is overdetermined by racial hierarchy. That doesn't take seriously the leadership of the oppressed. I don't like being a member of the church with a big C which has forsaken the call of a crucified Messiah and in its place embraced and been seduced by the allure of the powerful and the elite. I don't like living in a body and carrying out a life that is filled with contradictions like Paul said, the things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I do want to do, I do. Yet in all of these contradictions I hear God saying to us, we are more than conquerors. So the first question I'll give to you, given the trauma and moral injury we have all faced, what kind of practices must you and I engage in to acknowledge your ordinariness and unlock the treasure within? 
This is a question for you to wrestle with this week. We're filled with trauma. We're constantly bombarded with trauma. But what must we do to cultivate the treasure inside of us? So we're not persecuted and broken and shaken and tossed to and throw. But there is something that God is cultivating even in the middle of all this hurt and pain. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I am an ordinary treasure. I am an ordinary treasure. Second thing that I'll lift up real quick is that we are powerful weaklings. Everybody say powerful weaklings. Verse 7 says, so the all-surpassing power is from God, not ourselves. Uh, some of y'all caught that real quick, real quick, real quick. Now let me just help you out with power. One of the greatest fallacies of modernity and nation states in a neoliberal context is that we believe power is always tied to force. So when people talk about power in our country, it is always aggression. The militarization of police departments, they say, is a response to the growing fear of the power of terror. Whether it's terror from gangs or terror from the boogeyman called ISIS. So we will, as a nation, build up as much power through aggression and force and feel like that will cause us to be protected. But what happens when the power through aggression and force is grabbed a hold to by the corrupt? And believe me, my brothers and sisters, I believe the scripture that says there is none righteous. I believe that scripture. I don't believe that there are people out here who can be uh, 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 totally uh, uh, incapable of being seduced by the forces of self-deception, anger, hatred, fear, even me. I believe in nonviolence. Just don't push me. It's kind of my little <laughs> affirmation. <laughs> Man. Hello, somebody. I want to be nonviolent. But this week, when I'm out doing God's work, and my brother is out doing God's work, and we have police officers showing up at our homes, staked outside our houses, showing up to our friends' jobs, doing things that are trying to inflict psychological trauma. And we have mayors and governors who won't use their power to rein in these forces of evil, it lets me know that there's another kind of power I need to be tapped into. You and I must appreciate that there are moments where power that is diffuse, like I think as Derrida says, the power is not just centralized in one place, but it is diffused. There are pockets of power everywhere. And God is calling for the church then to take seriously what is the power we have. I am weak by myself. I am weak without God's power. I am unable to reach the, the, the places and spaces of my call. But when the power of God is in me and in you, we can do more with God's power. Lord, help me in here. Then we can with the power of this world. There's a reason why the scriptures say that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of human origin, but they're mighty through God. Now, I know some of us are like, well, Pastor Mike, that don't make no sense. Because look at all this trouble in the world. Look at these Christians who criticize black, white, Asian, brown, even.
even atheists, agnostics, it don't matter. Everybody critical of those who are moving in the power of God's justice, mercy. But my brothers and sisters, that's why we can't allow what is happening outside of us to overdetermine what God is doing in places we can't always see. Dr. King says it like this, that the arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. And I believe God needs a few of us to get on the end of that arc and pull it down faster. That is the power we have. But you would not have to believe that this power is in us. That we have access to this power through God. I may not have enough guns, bombs, to defeat the enemy I can see with my eyes. But I believe that there is a power in the people of God that an atomic bomb cannot wipe out. In our organizing work, we talk about power being organized money, organized ideas, and organized people. Why do you think the empire is striking back so hard on people who are organizing themselves against all this injustice? These folk not out here with no guns. People aren't protesting in the streets with guns and weapons. All they have is our body and our voice. But the empire, this system knows that if we organize as a people across race, across difference, across gender, across religion, this system has to come down. So the call for me and you is not to be people who are getting so caught up in trying to be powerful that we don't act with power. And I'm here to tell you, when you have power, you will serve the, the, the hurting. You will heal the hurting. You will love the, 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 the unlovable. You're not going to try to squash them with your power. And that's how you know this is the power that comes from God. This power is limitless. This power cannot be defeated. This power cannot be destroyed with a bullet. This power cannot be buried in a casket. This power is not essentialized in your one person. This power comes from God. Lord, help me in here. So you and I have to be able to resist the power of this age. Are you able to do that? Are you able to resist the power, the allure of the power that tells you you got to be Machiavellian on your job in order for you to get a, 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 a raise and, and, get, and get a promotion? Or do you believe that promotion does not come from the east or the west, but promotion comes from God? So if you serve God, then you will end up where God wants you to end up. And when you get to where God has for you, can't nobody pull you off that perch. But that means you can't be around here trying to hedge your bet. It's too much work for me in my mind. People say uh, they, their phones are tapped. I know I'm under surveillance. Watch what you say. I don't, I don't have time to watch what I say. Because you can't stop the work of God. As a follower of Jesus, you ought to be bold about that. Though they slay me, yet will I trust God. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to die now. Not with this wife and babies and y'all to love on and be loved by. But if I must die, I will die in the service of our God. I will not be a slave to this fallen world. Walking around here afraid of what somebody's going to do to us. On your job afraid what somebody's going to say to you. In your neighborhood afraid of what they're going to do to you. The devil is a lie. I shall not die, but I will live. And proclaim the goodness.
goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. My brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that you and I must be people who are willing to live. Somebody holler, live. I'm going to live through death. And if you are able to live through death, you'll ask yourself the question, what is God trying to resurrect in my life? I know that things are death-filled all around me. I'm not ignorant to the fact that death is surrounding me, but this scripture says it powerfully that even though the death is around me, I am seeing Jesus living through me. So what are you willing to live for? Somebody told me, oh, McBride, you out here and you may, you may be putting yourself at risk, but I tell them I'd rather die a good death in the service of the Lord than, than be walking around here the rest of my life fearful. Oh, what can the enemy do to the people of God? I'm telling you today that it's time for the church to stand up in a commitment to peace and love and justice. And no matter what the world has to say about it, we're going to live. Oh, Jesus. I'm reminded. I'm reminded. I'm reminded of the, the early church who had to wrestle with the aggression of the Roman Empire. I'm reminded of the martyrs who, who had to find themselves in the Roman Colosseums. And they were constantly finding themselves pursued by lions, tigers, and all kinds of other kinds of weapons trying to destroy their life. And these 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 threats were were coming against them and they were being told as long as you renounce your faith in God as long as you renounce the calling of Jesus in your life then you will be saved from harm but, but the the history books tell us that when they were in these coliseums you had all these other warriors and gladiators running around trying to defeat every one of these lions and tigers and bears oh my yeah and then and they were they were there and 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 you would see though these 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 christians uh, who would be dressed up in wedding attire and and they would stand in the middle of the coliseum uh, and while the gladiators are fighting for their lives uh, the christians would stand and hold hands uh, and they would start to sing hymns and praises to god uh, while the lions and the tigers tore their flesh apart uh, they did not resist uh, because they realized that i must bear witness uh, to my faith uh, in my call don't you know that that kind of honor and that kind of courage in the face of death, it caused all of the Roman folks watching in the Colosseum to want to take notice, not of the gladiators, but of the martyrs who were willing to die singing praises to their God in the middle of all of that death dealing going on. I wish I could talk to somebody today. Yeah. What are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? Uh, I'm saying that God is calling for some people in here uh, and some people out there uh, who are willing to not capitulate, uh, who are willing to not throw in the towel, uh, who are willing to not be intimidated uh, by the trouble that comes in your personal life uh, or the trouble that comes out in the world. Uh, why? Because we know that in all these things uh, we are more than conquerors uh, through him that loved us uh, through him that called us uh, through him that died for us uh, somebody shout hallelujah for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave. Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Somebody holler, I got the victory. 
Therefore, my beloved, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Therefore, my beloved, don't you dare throw in the towel. Don't you dare get filled with fear. For God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Don't you dare think you can't win. The enemy's going to come against us, but we are more than the world against us. When God is on our side, you shall overcome. If God be for you, who can be against you? Do I have anybody who believes that God, he's on your side? God, he has your back. God, he's working it out. Shout hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. This is a moment in time where I want history to look back on the church and we will lead the charge towards confident and bold, audacious commitment to love, peace, and justice. Don't you be one of these folk who get only your friends that look like you, only your friends that like what you like, only your friends who worship like you worship, only your friends who live in your neighborhood and hard and 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 and, and siphon yourself off from the rest of the group but you better mix in with everybody who loves peace and who loves peace and justice find you a politician who loves peace and justice find you a revolutionary who loves peace and justice find you a homeboy a homegirl a ace boon coon find you anybody who loves peace and justice find you a Muslim find you a Buddhist find you an agnostic find you an atheist Find you a man, find you a woman, find you a transgender, find you a homosexual, find somebody who loves peace and justice and make up in your mind that I, I will live, I will heal, I will do God's will, shout yes. Yeah. This is what we're called to do. We need the people of God to come together. You can work with folk even if you don't agree with them. You work on your job to make money with people you don't agree with. You fly on planes with people you don't agree with. I wish I could talk to you. I only don't fly on planes that are flown by Christians. When I get on a plane, I don't ask the pilot, have you received Jesus since you believed? All I want to know is, do, can you get me from San Francisco to Baton Rouge? If you can't do that, I'm taking the what? Next flight. So why, why would we be so limited in our peacemaking work? In our justice work that I'm only going to work with people who look like me. People who worship like me. That's a function of white supremacy. And I don't care who you are in this place. You can be white, black, brown, Asian, red. I don't care. 
white supremacy is not created to benefit you. Unless you're wealthy and a man and a landowner and white, all of them together, white supremacy ain't for you. And I'm here to tell you that now. I'm here to tell you that. And if you happen to be all of them things, then it is your responsibility to use the privilege that you have been given to help liberate everybody. The problem with many of us is that we will spend our whole lives chasing after those kind of criteria. I want to be white. I want to be rich. I want to be a elite, a, a landowner elite. I want to be a man. We we'll spend our whole life trying to reach for that. Rather than being who God created you to be. My white brothers and sisters, God did not create you white. You European. Are you listening to me? You need to go find your cultural heritage that is not grounded in whiteness. Recover your Irish heritage, your Celtic heritage, your Jewish, your Italian, recover your heritage because in your heritage, you will see difference. Are you following me? Black folk in here, over trying to be overdetermined by whiteness. You are more than what whiteness says you are. What better description of who we are than us being God's people? Everybody, everybody. Even Michael Xavier Johnson, who killed, is accused of killing up all these people. Dylan Roof, Pookie, police officers, corrupt ones. They're all creating the image of God. So I can't feel happy about anybody's death. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I can't be happy about that. God's heart grieves at the death of the wicked. It's what the scriptures say. So if God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, how are we over here celebrating? I get angry. But you can be angry and sin not. So when you out in the streets, it's all right to be angry. I am not someone who believes we whistle while we on our way to the grave. If you coming after me, you, you better, you, you going to have some evidence that I didn't go out of here silently, that I resisted at every turn. The scripture says some resisted even to blood. When that turn comes out, we're going to have a conversation about legitimate violence. But that's a conversation for another day. I, you, we must be called, oh, my brothers and sisters, to peace, justice, togetherness. And it can't be dominated by the country. It has to be our call. Grab the hand of the person next to you.